The history of the Knights Hospitaller traces back to the early years of the Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, also known as the Knights Hospitaller until 1309. Formed in the 11th century, the Hospitallers played a significant role in the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the Crusades, alongside other military orders, for example the Knights Templar and the Teutonic Knights. While initially focused on providing care for pilgrims, the Hospitallers evolved to become a formidable military force dedicated to safeguarding pilgrim routes. Led by figures like Gerard and Raymond de Poy, they earned recognition from the Pope in 1113 and became known for their distinctive white cross. Their history, chronicled in Latin sources and later accounts by historians like William of Tyre and Joseph de la Ville Leroux, remains intertwined with the broader narrative of the Crusades in the Holy Land. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If it's your first time here, it's good to have you. If you're returning, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming back. If you'd like to support the channel, I've opened a Patreon, where all videos are available ad-free. This helps me keep the channel going. Other than that, if you want to bump me up in the algorithm, a like, comment, and subscribe does wonders for my exposure on this platform. Otherwise, please relax and enjoy the video. Today's topic is a history of the Knights Hospitallers in the Crusades. I hope you can enjoy it. Without further ado, let's begin. Raymond de Bois, 1083-1160, was a French knight who succeeded Gerard as the second Grand Master of the Order. Serving from around 1122 or 1123 until 1160. Little is known about Raymond's role in the Order before his assumption of the Magisterium. His first official act was recorded on the 9th of December, 1124. During his early years as Grand Master, the Order focused primarily on its social mission. Raymond divided the members of the Order into clerical, military, and serving brothers, and established the first significant hospitaller infirmary near the Church of the Hospital, rather Holy Sepulchre, in Jerusalem. He also engaged in the Order's business affairs, which were mainly conducted in Spain at the time. Raymond is credited with giving the Hospitallers its first statutes, which are believed to have been composed around 1130. The rule of the Hospitaller predates 1153, as it was approved by Pope Eugene the Third after 1145, but before 1153, more specifically the 7th of July, before his death. Now this marked the official establishment of the Hospitaller as a proper order, just like the Teutonic Knights and the Knights Templar. From 1135 to 54, the order enjoyed an exemption from local religious authorities. Additionally, Raymond introduced the order's Great Seal, which was in use from the 12th century all the way until 1798. This seal depicted the Grand Master kneeling in prayer before the patriarchal cross on the obverse, accompanied by sacred letters 
Alpha and Omega, symbolizing the second coming of Christ. Now, back to Raymond du Bois. Raymond du Bois is depicted in several paintings housed in the Celles de Crusades, which is the Hall of Crusades in the Chateau de Versailles in France. Alexandra Lamelin's full-length portrait of Raymond du Bois is displayed in the third room of the hall, and is quite a sight to see. Additionally, Two battle scenes featuring Raymond du Bois in military action in Syria around 11.30 are depicted in the following room. These paintings highlight Raymond's significant role as Grand Master of the Hospitallers during the Crusades. The First Crusade concluded with the capture of Jerusalem in 1099 but it took until 1104 to fully secure the city of Arca. During the early years of the Crusader presence in Arca, the Hospitallers received donated properties in the region. Baldwin I of Jerusalem granted permission for the construction of a commandery north of the San Croix Church in 1110. However, in 1130, the Hospitallers decided to relocate near the north wall of the city, due to damages sustained during work at the church. This new location became the Hospitalier Commandery of saint John d'Acre. The Hospitallers received their first castle, Coliath, from Pons of Tripoli in 1127, which remained in their possession until seized by the Ayubids in 1207. By 1149, the commandery of the Hospitallers in Arca was described as a very impressive fortified building by many of the pilgrims who came across it. In 1143, Celestine II granted the Hospitallers jurisdiction over Saint Maria Alemana, a hospital established in 1128, to accommodate German pilgrims and other crusaders. While formerly under the jurisdiction of the Hospitallers, the Pope decreed that the prior and brothers of the Domus Theonoricum, the House of the Germans, should always be Germans themselves. This tradition laid the groundwork for the formation of the Teutonic Order in 1190. But that's for another video. Raymond also took over the management of the Leprosarium outside Jerusalem, which later became the Order of St. Lazarus, with Raymond serving as its seventh Grand Master just before his death. A conflict arose between Raymond and Fulk of Anglomen the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, around 1156. The Patriarch accused the Hospitallers of various religious infractions and personal affronts, including competing with the Holy Sepulchre by the beauty and height of their buildings. Sounds like jealousy to me. The conflict escalated when the Hospitallers invaded the Holy Sepulchre with an armed force in response to the Patriarch's complaints. Fulk sought redress from Pope Adrian IV, asking for the withdrawal of a papal bull confirming the prerogatives of the order. Fulk then led a contingent to Rome in 1155 but the case resulted in 
endless debates, and no satisfaction for Folk upon his return to Jerusalem later that year. Quite a waste of time, and a wasted trip. Under the leadership of Raymond de Bois, the Knights Hospitalier first transitioned towards their more military role. Of course, they were around before Raymond de Bois was, but the world was changing, and so was their role within it. An act dated 17th of January 1126 marks the first reference to a constable of the Hospitallers, named Durand, who held military responsibilities. Now, while it is unclear if Durand was a member of the order, or simply hired by the hospital, this development predated the formation of the Templars by two years. However, the rising influence of the Templars also contributed to the Hospitaller's increased military focus. Depictions from the 19th century in the Salles de Croissades depict Raymond in battle as early as 1130. Can't argue with that. The Hospitaller's assumption of a more military role is exemplified by their involvement in the construction and operation of the Crusader Castle at Beth Giblain. Built by Folk of Jerusalem in 1135 to fortify the kingdom, the castle was donated to the Hospitaliers in 1136. Following the example of the Knights Templar, Raymond instituted protections for pilgrims by providing security for their travels to the holy places. Additionally, Raymond hired knights and men-at-arms as mercenaries and participated, through intermediaries, in the defense of the kingdom. By 1154, a category of brother priests was granted by Pope Anastasius IV, and although physicians didn't appear among the order's medical personnel until the statutes of 1184, the military aspect was formalized earlier with the recognition of brothers-in-arms since 1160. Consequently, the order had became legally a religious military order. Beginning in 1137, the order actively participated in wars waged by the Kingdom of Jerusalem against its enemies, who regularly attacked, and from all sides. Ascalon, due to its strategic location on the seashore en route to Egypt, posed a constant threat to the Christians, leading to continuous incursions into the southern part of the kingdom. On the advice of Fulk, the Franks decided to fortify the position of Hassan ibn Akar, which belonged to the Hospitallers and was situated east of Ascalon. This task of fortification directed with urgency by the Latin patriarch William of Malines, was entrusted to the Hospitaliers especially, positioning them at the forefront of defence against the Egyptians. During the Second Crusade of 1147, the Hospitaliers had become a significant force in the kingdom, and the political importance of the Grand Master had risen considerably. At the Council of Acre in June 1148, Raymond de Bois was among the leaders who decided to undertake the siege of Damascus. Despite the 
disastrous outcome of this siege, the blame was primarily placed on the Templars rather than the Hospitallers. I'm sure Raymond de Poy was very relieved when he heard that. In the Holy Land, the influence of the Hospitallers continued to grow, with Raymond's governance playing a decisive role in many military operations. Well, after the failure of the Second Crusade, attention shifted back to the fortress at Ascalon, which at that time was held by the Fatimids, just one of the many enemies. Amidst the siege of Ascalon in 1153, a truce was called to allow each side to bury their dead. Despite facing numerous setbacks, including a serious defeat suffered by the Templars, Baldwin III of Jerusalem was persuaded by Raymond and the Latin patriarch Fulk to continue the siege. Renewed efforts led to capitulation of the besieged Muslims on the 19th of August 1153, with the city evacuated the following day. In 1156, Nur ad-Din and his brother Nasr ad-Din routed a force of hospitallers near their stronghold at Khaled el Markab near Banyas. By the way, I'll do my best with any Arabic pronunciations. My French is probably embarrassing too. Following a broken peace treaty by Baldwin III in February 1157, Humphrey II of Turon, master of Banias, sought the aid of the Hospitallers to face the Zengids. Despite their participation, they suffered a defeat near Ras el Ma on April 24th, leading to the conquest of Banias on the 10th of May. 1157. However, they did manage to defend the castle, which Baldwin III resupplied to maintain a strong garrison there. In a subsequent encounter at Jacob's Ford on the 19th of June, the king was routed, but he managed to retreat to Safed and then to Arca. Nur ad-Din abandoned his attack on Banias and returned to Aleppo, Syria, fearing an assault by Kilij Arsan II. Humphrey later sold Banias and the castle to the Hospitallers. Under the leadership of Raymond de Bois, the Knights Hospitaller received significant support and resources to defend the Holy Land against the encroaching Muslim forces. Raymond's tenure saw a surge in donations to the Order, particularly from the county of Tripoli, which managed to bolster their financial capabilities. Moreover, Raymond's magisterium marked the acquisition of the Hospitallers' first crusader castles, solidifying their military presence in the region. Of course, once you're in a castle, once anybody is in a castle, it's very hard to get them out of the castle. In addition to material support, the Hospitallers secured numerous privileges and exemptions from the papacy, granting the order independence and freedom from the authority of Diocesan officials, much to the official's chagrin. These privileges provided the Hospitallers with the financial resources and autonomy necessary to effectively carry out their mission. Among the most notable strongholds established during Raymond's leadership were the Krak 
de Chevalier, a formidable fortress in the Levant, occupied by the Hospitallers from 1142 to 1271. Also Margat on the Syrian coast, another significant stronghold held from 1186 to 1285, one year off the century. Bad luck. These fortifications played a crucial role in the Hospitallers' defense of the Holy Land, and served as symbols of their military power, but also dedication to the Gauls. Now, Raymond de Bois' death, around 1160, marked the end of an era for the Knights Hospitaller. He was succeeded by Auger de Balben, who served as Grand Master for a brief period until he disappeared in 1162. No one knows where he went. Following Auger de Balben's disappearance, Gilbert of Asselet, a French knight, assumed the position of Grand Master in 1162. Under his leadership, the Knights Hospitaller underwent significant militarization, acquiring territories in the county of Tripoli and the Principality of Antioch. Gilbert played a key role in securing regal rights for the order, granting them military privileges above common law and effectively establishing a form of quasi-sovereignty. One of Gilbert's notable actions was his involvement in the Crusader invasion of Egypt, where he encouraged Almeric of Jerusalem to declare war on Egypt and expand the kingdom's territories. However, the campaign faced a significant defeat at the Battle of Harim in 1164, resulting in the capture of Raymond III of Tripoli and the loss of the city of Banyas to Nur ad-Din. In 1167, Gilbert participated in another campaign against Egypt, but the Crusaders were defeated again at the Battle of Al-Babin. Despite all of the setbacks, Gilbert's leadership marked a period of military expansion and strategic engagement for the Knights Hospitaller solidifying their role in the defense of the Holy Land and their pursuit of territorial gains. Gilbert's fervent belief in the conquest of Egypt led to his active involvement in several military campaigns aimed at securing territory in the region. In October 1168, he provided significant military support to Amalric's campaign, offering 1,000 knights and Turkopolievs in exchange for Bilbase and the surrounding territories. And they had some initial success, including the seizure of Bilbase. But the campaign once again ultimately failed mainly due to how hard the re resistance was from the Egyptians, and the formation of a new alliance against the Crusaders. Following the failure of the campaign, Amalric sought assistance from other Western powers, sending an embassy that included the Grand Commander of the Hospitallers, Guy de Monny, to plead for support. Despite their efforts, the embassy returned empty-handed after two years of very fruitless negotiations. In the fall of 1169, Amalric launched another campaign against Egypt, with the assistance of the Emperor and the Hospitallers. However, this expedition also ended in failure, 
resulting in widespread blame being directed towards Gilbert for the Order's misfortunes. Gotta blame somebody. May as well be him. He was accused of neglecting the Hospitaller's charitable mission and basically ruining the whole Order. Well, the writing was on the wall for Gilbert, and he resigned from his position as Grand Master. Only to reconsider this later. Gilbert's resignation, of course, marked a period of instability within the Order's leadership. With Gaston de Merolles serving a brief but pretty unremarkable term as his successor. However, the internal conflicts continued to persist, highlighting the challenges faced by hospitalers during this turbulent period. In 1171, Jobert of Syria succeeded Gilbert as the Grand Master, and played a crucial role in securing the release of Raymond III of Tripoli, who had, aforementioned, been captured by Nur ad-Din in 1164. I'm sure he was having a great time in the prison. Oof. Gilbert's tenure also saw further military engagements, including participation in campaigns against Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt, and his forces in Homs. Overall, Gilbert's ambitious military endeavours and subsequent resignation underscored the many complexities of the Hospitaller's role in the Crusades, and the challenges they faced in balancing their military duties with their charitable duties. Of course, it would get him to the point where people were a little bit confused as to what the actual mission was. Were they there to fight wars? Were they there to protect pilgrims? Perhaps the hospitaliers themselves did not know either. Well, Roger de Molines assumed the position of Grand Master of the Knights Hospitaller following the death of Jobert in 1177. During Roger's leadership, the Hospitallers emerged as one of the most formidable military organizations in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. This marked an even deeper departure from their original mission of providing medical care. One of Roger's early actions was to encourage Baldwin IV of Jerusalem to continue the vigorous prosecution of the war against Saladin. In November 1177, Roger himself participated in the pivotal Battle of Monte Cassade, where the forces of the Kingdom of Jerusalem achieved a significant victory against the Ayyubids. Indeed, the Battle of Monte Cassade is perhaps one of the most famous battles of the Crusades. Video on that very, very soon. I promise. I know the list is long, but I will get there. Well, however, the military focus of the Hospitallers under Roger's leadership prompted Pope Alexander III to kind of pull the reins on them and remind them of their original charitable mission. Stay in your lane, basically. Between 1178 and 1180, the Pope issued a bull calling the Hospitallers back to the observance of the rule established by Raymond de Puy. The bull forbade hospitaliers from taking up arms unless they were attacked, 
and emphasized their function and the importance of caring for the sick and impoverished. Well, back to their original job, it seems. In 1184, Roger embarked on a tour of Europe alongside Arnold of Toroja, the successor of the Templar Grand Master Odo de Saint Amand, that's the Knights Templar, and Latin Patriarch Heraclius. Their purpose was to appeal to Pope Lucius III to rally support for a new crusade. However, the death of Baldwin V in Jerusalem in August of 1186 brought about a bit of a succession crisis, with Roger opposing the ascension of Sibylla of Jerusalem and Guy of Lusignan to the throne. Initially, Roger even refused to hand over his key to the royal treasury upon their coronation in 1186, putting him at odds with prominent figures, such as Reynald de Chatillon and Grand Templar Master Gerard de Ridfaux. At the end of 1186, a pretty eventful year for everybody, it seems, Renard de Chatillon defied the truce with Saladin by capturing a caravan travelling from Cairo to Damascus, which included the sister of the emir. In response to this provocation, the barons gathered in Jerusalem under the leadership of Guy de Lusignan in, on the 27th of March 1187, demanding a reconciliation between Lusignan and Raymond III of Tripoli. Roger de Moron, Gerard de Ridfort, Archbishop Josius, Balian of Ibelin and Renard Grenier were appointed to negotiate with Raymond III in Tiberias. However, their diplomatic efforts were thwarted when they unexpectedly encountered Muslim troops, leading to the ill-fated Battle of Cresson against Saladin on the 1st of May, 1187. And it was a critical battle. After all, Roger de Moulin was killed. Somebody stabbed him with a big spear. Rest in peace, Roger. While well, following Roger's death, William Borel assumed the role of Grand Master at Interim. Borel had previously served as Grand Commander for a brief period in 1187. He then appointed Armin Gold de Aspa as his successor as Grand Commander. On the 12th of July, 1187, Saladin laid siege to Tiberias and successfully captured the city. Despite the advice of Hospitaller commands, Guy de Lusignan, influenced by the Templars led by Girard de Ridfall, decided to attempt to rescue the city. This led to the Battle of Hattin, on the 4th of July, where an army led by Raymond III of Tripoli was surprised by Saladin's forces. Well, it did not go well for them. The Templars and the Hospitallers were unable to withstand the attack, and the battle ended in a devastating defeat for the Crusaders. Many of the captured Hospitallers and Templars, including William Borel, were subsequently put to death by Saladin, with only Gerard de Ridford spared. Lucky for him. 
Hospitaller Knight, Nicasius of Sicily, later revered as a martyr, was one of the more notable casualties. The captured nobles, including the king, were taken to Damascus and held for ransom. Reynald de Chatillon, however, was beheaded, and he was beheaded by Saladin himself. Saladin wanted to do the deed as retribution for Reynald's numerous offences. After the death of William Borel, Armengol de Aspa assumed the position of Grand Master. The Muslim victory at Hattin also allowed Saladin to advance towards Jerusalem, arriving at the city on the 17th of December 1187, and commencing the siege of Jerusalem three days later. Defending the city were a few knights and a small garrison of hospitallers and templars, under the command of Balian of Ibelin, who was the highest-ranking lord at the city at the time. On the 2nd of October, 18, I beg your pardon, 1187, Jerusalem capitulated, and the Christians were permitted to evacuate the city in exchange for a ransom. The evacuation occurred in three groups, with the Templars leading the first, followed by the Hospitallers, and the Latin Patriarch of Heraclius of Jerusalem and Balian of Ibelin leading the last. They were escorted to the borders of the county of Tripoli, while ten friars of the order remained in Jerusalem to attend the wounded and the sick and there were plenty of them. Despite the loss at Jerusalem, the Franks remained under attack at the siege of Tyre. Saladin personally reinforced and supported his troops during the siege, which commenced on the 11th of November, 1187. Armengol de Aspa led the Hospitallers in defense of Tyre, alongside the Templars. By the beginning of 1188, the Franks had lost control of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, but they did manage to retain Tyre, albeit holding on by a thread. The formidable castle at Maragat, remember that one, was too deemed, too difficult rather, to assault. So Saladin simply shrugged his shoulders and didn't bother with it. The game was simply not worth the candle, and the people inside weren't going to be causing much damage, all holed up in their stone fortress. Meanwhile, the Hospitallers had been defending Belvoir Castle since August 1187, on the 2nd of January, 1188, they abandoned the fortress and launched a successful attack on the Muslim forces besieging it. This attack resulted in the death of Saladin's general in charge, Saif al-Din Mahmud, and the capture of a significant cache of arms. However, to the east, beyond the Jordan River, Al-Adil I, Saladin's brother, launched an attack on the castles of Crac de Chevaliers and Montreal, both of which surrendered due to lack of supplies by the end of September 1188. Additionally, the siege of Safed concluded with the capitulation of the castle belonging to the Templars on November 30. The Hospitallers continued to resist at Belvoir Castle until the 3rd of January 1189, when they were forced to surrender due to famine. In late 1189, 
Armengol de Aspa stepped down from his position as Grand Master, leading to a temporary void in leadership, until Garnier of Nablus was elected as his successor in 1190. Garnier had been severely wounded at the Battle of Hattin in 1187, but managed to make his way to Ascalon, where he recovered from his injuries. During this period, he awaited the departure of Richard I of England for the Third Crusade in Paris. Garnier arrived in Messina on the 23rd of September, where he met with noble figures such as Philippe Auguste and Robert IV de Sablé, who would soon become the Grand Master of the Templars. Among the hospitaliers accompanying Garnier was the Italian Ugo Canifri. Departing Messina on the 10th of April 1191, Garnier sailed with Richard's fleet and anchored at the point of Lemesos on the 1st of May. Despite Garnier's efforts at mediation, Richard subdued the island on the 11th of May. Setting sail once more on the 5th of June, they arrived at Arca, which had been under Ayubid control since 1187. In Arca they found Philippe Auguste leading the siege, a two-year-long attempt to dislodge the Ayubids. The besiegers eventually prevailed and on the 12th of July, 1191, the Muslim defenders capitulated. On the 22nd of August, 1191, Richard travelled south to Arsuf, with the Templars forming the vanguard, and the Hospitaliers positioned at the rear guard. Accompanied by an elite force prepared to intervene as needed, Richard encountered heavy pressure from the Muslims at the beginning of the Battle of Arasuf on September 7th. Garnier's knights, situated at the rear of the military column, faced intense attacks. Garnier rode forward to pursue Richard to initiate an attack, but Richard initially refused. Eventually, Garnier and another knight charged forward, leading the rest of the Hospitaller force into battle. Despite disobeying Richard's orders, Garnier's actions contributed significantly to the victory, and Richard ultimately signaled for a full charge, breaking the enemy's ranks. And with that, we reach the end of the Battle of Arsuf, and the early days of the militarization of the Knights Hospitaller. Thank you very much for listening to this rather long-winded video. If you've enjoyed the content, why not have a look at my Patreon, where all the videos are available ad-free. Or, leave your thoughts in the comments, like the video, and subscribe for more. I'm always making more videos, and I'm showing no signs of slowing down. Thank you very much for listening, it's once again been a pleasure, and with that, I wish you good night.